soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful faith, and the things of earth will grow of His glory and grace. Friends, welcome to our midweek reflections as we continue to reflect on the Psalms set for the Easter season. Today I'm going to take a look at Psalm 31 together with some help from Julian of Norwich, the medieval mystic. Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. People experience all kinds of adversity in life. There are personal experiences such as illness, loss of a loved one, abuse, bullying, job loss, and financial instability. Then there are the shared realities of tragic events and natural disasters. In this case, a pandemic which is impacting deeply on all of us. As people have to learn to cope with and work through very challenging life experiences, it's a helpful time to think about what it means to be resilient and how we build resilience in our lives. Being resilient does not mean that you do not experience distress. It is not mental toughness. It is rather working through emotional pain, vulnerability, and difficult circumstances. Developing resilience involves an inward and an outward journey. There are a number of factors that contribute to building resilience in our lives, and there isn't a simple to-do list to work through adversity. The Psalms, however, link resilience with refuge, finding security and safety in the midst of uncertainty. Amongst the many things being revealed by this current challenge, we are being faced with just how fragile the world we have created is. Our economies, our institutions, our systems, these things we build our lives on are not ultimate. They are subject to change and they must change, especially at this time. If we are to find refuge at this moment, we need to find it in our own personal practice of faith. We can find refuge in our faith not as a place of escaping the challenges the world is facing us with, but rather as a place of building the resilience we need to confront them. The pandemic of COVID-19 is often called unprecedented. And for many people cooped up in their homes in different countries, the experience is both unparalleled and challenging. But in the late medieval period, individuals self-isolated professionally. Some people, women in particular, permanently withdrew from society to live walled in, alone in a room attached to a church. They were known as anchorites. Isolation empowered these women to express their love for God and minister to their fellow human beings through their prayers and their counsel. 
some of the guidance given to anchorites seems particularly pertinent right now. According to the manuals for anchorites, they should guard their cell windows. Most anchorites had a window that opened out onto the busy street where they would engage with passers-by. People would come and ask for counsel, advice. They were a connecting point for the community. But to prevent them from falling into temptation and being distracted from their prayers and meditation, one manual declares, Disturbance only enters the heart through something, either seen or heard, tasted or smelt, or felt externally. Several guides recommended having a female friend scrupulously guard the anchorite's window, refusing to allow access to visitors who spread gossip and lies. Maybe we need to take some time to reflect on what it might mean to guard the window of our lives. Social media and the endless streams of news today can quite be like the visitors described in the manuals. This is a time to reflect on the influences we allow into our lives and to begin to become conscious about setting boundaries for ourselves and choosing the voices that we are going to listen to. Routines were key for the anchorites. Anchorites recited sequences of prayers, psalms, and other Bible readings at fixed points of the day. According to modern survival psychology, dividing a problem or a stretch of time into manageable steps is helpful when we face a crisis. Equally important is performing each step one by one, never looking further ahead than the next step. This is a time at the moment to pace ourselves, to bring ourselves back to sustainable rhythms of work, prayer and rest, and to reassess the expectations that we place upon ourselves so that we may set for ourselves manageable and achievable goals that help us to move forward within the limitations of our present moment in time. On the one hand, social distancing can feel limiting. Julian of Norwich, the anchorite, felt that as well. She exclaimed, This place is a prison. But the cramped space of a cell also granted medieval women a spiritual freedom. In his letter to the anchorite Eve of Wilton, a monk wrote, My cell is so narrow. You may say, but oh, how wide is the sky. Julian of Norwich, who I just mentioned, is the earliest known woman to write in English. Julian promises readers will experience emotional turmoil during any crisis, but will ultimately conquer it. When adapting to life during a crisis, we need to acknowledge the challenge circumstances face us with right now in real life. This is essential. At the same time, we should prepare ourselves to emerge into a better post-crisis way of life. Only by acknowledging our vulnerability, both physical and mental, and consequently taking action to protect and take care of ourselves and others, will we make it through this moment in time. Julian wrote in the context of her own sickness, and in the shadow that had been cast by the Black Death. The ravages of the Black Death led many to warn in medieval Europe that people were under the judgment of God. With 30 to 50% of the total population succumbing to the illness, it was easy to reach this conclusion. In the crucified Christ, however, Julian saw God sharing the suffering of humanity and redeeming it. Julian of Norwich went so far as to claim that Christ's emaciated and bloodied body resembled our foul black death, which our fair, bright, blessed Lord bore for our sins. In becoming the plague victim, Jesus revealed that there is no anger in God. The crucified Christ, she said, pointed towards a conquering love that takes suffering and redeems it and brings humanity back into union with God. Not only did the ravages of life humble the soul, they forced us into our inner depths 
to find the answers that we truly need. This required a turn to the interior life. Pain and suffering cast human frailty into relief and therefore, therefore compelled a person to gaze into their own soul, which is doing nothing less than peering at the mirror of God. This medieval antidote to the Black Death was an invitation to turn within and find Christ, something anyone could do in her home. With so many of our churches closed across the world, and here in South Africa with all of our churches closed, Maybe this is a time to turn within and to find the crucified God within us and so to gaze upon the world with new eyes. Julian's near-death experiences made her value the wonder and joy in each moment and the gift of life that God gives to us. Her writings record the visions that come in her illness and they shine with compassion and love. Her message speaks beyond the Middle Ages and is as fresh today as when it was written in the Revelations of Divine Love. She wrote this about one of her visions. And in this Christ showed me a little thing, the size of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, and it was as round as any ball. I looked there upon it with the eye of my understanding, and I thought, what might this be? And I was answered thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how it might last, for I thought it might disintegrate to nothingness. And I was answered, it lasts and ever shall, because God loves it. Maybe as we are aware of our vulnerability, of the vulnerability of our world, we can find refuge in knowing that it is held in the hands of love. Right now, it is tempting to want to blame and divide. It is tempting to take out our frustration and fear on one another. And there are voices that are seeking to do that right now. Let us rather use this moment to journey inwards, to find our center in Christ, and outwards to be the presence of Christ. Let us place ourselves and this time in the hands of God, whom Christ embodied for us, and know that this time shall pass. As Julian proclaimed, friends, all shall be well, and all shall we be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Maybe as a way into prayer today, I can share a few words from Brother Richard Hendrick. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there may be scarcity. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But they say in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and grey and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques and temples are preparing to welcome and shelter the homeless, the sick and the weary. All over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbours in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality to how big we really are, to how small we really are, to how little control we really have, to what really matters, to love. So we pray, and we remember that yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate. Yes, there is isolation, but there does not have to be loneliness. Yes, there is hardship, but there does not have to be hard-heartedness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disconnection. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be the rebirth of love. Wake to the choices you make as to how you live now. Today, breathe. Listen beyond your anxiety and open the windows of your soul. The birds are singing again. The sky is clearing. And we are always encompassed 
by love. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, the psalmist reminds us that God is both a source of refuge and a source of resilience. God, we deeply feel that our world is in trouble with the spread of the coronavirus. There is a heightened sense of fear and anxiety about the future. We ask that we may calmly and lovingly trust in you and care for all who are affected by this pandemic. Please bless the work of health professionals, government officials, aged care workers, policemen and women, those who are part of the military, and those who work in community NGOs. Grant them strength and wisdom. We pray for all who feel stressed and worried, that they may find peace and reassurance. Free us from panic and selfishness. We pray for all those who experience losses at this time. May they find comfort and support. And may all our congregations and faith communities be places of empathy, compassion and calm in all we face. In the name of Jesus. Amen.